Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America online at thisweekinamerica.us. Centuries ago, what could have happened to the face of trade of one of the most progressive states in the world today? Dr. Wayne Allen developed a thesis on the Apopaskan Native Tribe in Canada and Alaska in an attempt to trace the origin of the maternal clan system as opposed to the typical paternal lineage of the rest of the world. Wayne Allen was born in Ottawa, the capital of Canada, graduated from North Grenville District High School in Kempville, Ontario, has a BA and MA in School of Social Anthropology from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, a diploma in Public Administration from Carleton University, and a diploma in Business from Algonquin College in Ottawa. He's worked as a teacher in Quebec, the Bahamas, Manitoba, Saskatchewan before going into computer operations and retiring from IBM in Ottawa in 2009. He's currently retired, living with his wife in Ottawa and working on his books. The author of Athapaskan Matrilini, uh, and I'll make sure I get that correct here in a second, and Trade in Canada and Alaska. Wayne Allen with us on the program. Wayne, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, great to be here, Rick. Matrilini, there I have that. So we'll get all of that together here. Let's talk. This is fascinating. It really is great information. We've got some pictures on the video portion that we'll be uh, showing a as we're talking to Wayne. This began, as I understand, as, as a thesis. How did this whole venture begin for you? Oh, it began when I was an anthropology student. Uh, I got desperate towards the end of the year <laughs> looking for a thesis. I decided on this one, which we had been discussing all year. And uh, I started investigating, and sure enough, the pieces fell into place uh, smoothly, and I got my degree. Well, was, and that's good, and you've educated all of us in the process with what you found. It's been said that you found numerous interesting facts. Uh, you discuss and you elaborate on those in the book. Talk about the, the, the thesis behind this. What were you looking for? And talk about the process because you actually got some answers, answers that some people were looking for and couldn't find before you got involved. Uh, the information was there all along, only it was scattered into many bits from various sources, to, from professional anthropologists to missionaries to fur traders some of which lived a century ago. But the information was all there. I just had to put, put it together. How time-consuming was that? Uh, I spent the whole summer on it, from May to September. As an anthropologist, what is, the, what is that like when you are able to do some research, find information that people, apparently some maybe didn't have the patience to look for, and suddenly you're getting answers to some of these questions that people have had for, for decades. What's that like when you started putting this puzzle together? Very satisfying. It gave me a thrill. I enjoyed it. The book we're talking about, I'm going to try the title here, Athapaskan, Matrilene and Trade in Canada and Alaska. Wayne W. Allen, our guest on the program. Books available, of course, wherever you find books. And his website is www.allen.com. You can go to our website thisweekinamerica.us and link on directly. Let's talk about some of the things that you found. And you've got a question on, on the website you start with is, why did native hunters in the wilds of northern British Columbia, the Yukon and Alaska, trace their ancestry through their mother's side of the family? The author has given a definitive answer to this question, which has long puzzled scholars and others. Talk about that. Was that sort of the, the driving question behind the, uh, the research that you did? Yes, that was under discussion for a long time by many scholars in the States and in other places. Were you surprised at your findings when you got to digging in this? You talk about, uh, uh, as you're looking back in the, in the different groups, talk about that and the, the tribal nature of what you found. Uh, well, well, what I found was um, a lot of different things. Uh, items. Uh, it was a pretty, uh, a pretty, uh, a gru uh, uh, I shouldn't say gruesome, but it was a pretty tedious 
uh, go at times looking through a lot of these information, a lot of information that led nowhere. But uh, I had a, an advantage over other people. I knew what I wanted to show, and uh, and I looked out for it, and I found it. Yeah, you had a a clear mission as you're doing the research. We're seeing some pictures uh, as as we're we're talking here in the, in the video portion of this. You can't see the pictures, but we're seeing uh, obviously some, some tribes. Talk a little bit about the, the pictures, and then we'll we'll get specifically into uh, some of the natives dividing society into into group names. Fascinating that we'll talk about in a second. What are these pictures? What are, what are we going to see in the pictures? Oh, those pictures are of the native peoples, and they're cast by a native artist commissioned by myself and my publisher. And they are, I believe, as close as we'll ever get to what these people actually looked like. And all those pictures are based on my source material. So and, they actually did that. And you'll find information available, of course, in the book, Athapaskan and Athapaskan, Matrileni and Trade in Canada and Alaska. The website's www.allen.com. You can link down by going to our website. It's interesting that uh, the natives were divided society into groups like wolf, crow, that, that type of thing. Talk about how they, how they d- divided into various groups. Uh, actually, uh, they were not as much divided as they were united by the two groups. Okay. Because if you were a wolf, you had to marry a crow and, and vice versa. But those were two divisions within their societies, and uh, they were important. Uh, they were considered brother and sister. If you married a woman in your own descent group, like a, a crow, and you were a crow, then you'd be criticized and your marriage would be broken up. They'd tell you, no, no, she's your sister. So, yeah, these are actual, these are actual kin groups and uh, brothers and, and they have the same relation to you as brothers and sisters and it, it's fascinating reading the the, the structure there and, and you, they talk about enforcing strict trading monopolies talk about that because that's the way they went about the trade and we'll talk about the art of the deal here in a few seconds everybody's got the art of the deal now but but talk about the uh, the, the trading monopolies and how they set this up because they had their own little infrastructure didn't they uh, yeah, yes, uh, the, tra- the trade uh, trading monopoly worked on the basis of these kinship systems. You, uh, you had to be in the same uh, group as your trading partner, like you're both wolves, yes. right? And uh, the advantage of a matrilineal system is that you could trade, you could marry your daughter or your wife's sister to your trading partner. And that would give you more control and more information coming to you about your trading partner. And it'd be further tied to you. Not just a business deal, a family deal as well. Now the monopoly comes into it uh, 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 very importantly. Uh, every, every native could gather furs, but only an official trader or a trading chief had the right to tr- trade them to the Hudson's Bay Company or to people outside of his group, outside the tribe. And, uh, and, uh, and if anybody, tr- uh, but the official trader tried to go to the post, they'd be stopped. They'd have to sell their furs to the trade chief at a lower price. And then at the annual trading event, he'd go to the Hudson Bay Company and trade it there for a much higher price or to the next group of natives farther up the river or down the river and get much higher prices there. Uh, profits were very good. Uh, it was a thousand percent profit. You'd sell it for something for 10 times the price you paid for it, and that continued throughout the area. 
So they were pretty shrewd business people in the way they had this set up and the way they had it, uh, the profit built into it, weren't they? Uh, yes, very shrewd, um, very monopolistic. Uh, most of the Europeans um, writing on this missed the monopolistic uh, character of these people at all. Yeah. It's interesting because you talk about that and you mentioned the, the, the trade chiefs before Talk about that because there was a hierarchy, there was a structure involved in this, wasn't there, when they were when they were doing the the actual selling of the product? Oh, oh yes. I mean, uh, if uh, the deal was very important, and in fact, it was a very uh, a great deal. I mean, it was the climax of the whole trade meeting. And it was long and lots of arguing, lots of fighting, lots of taking the goods back, and lots of threats, lots of intimidation. And, uh, and it looked like these people were really, uh, a really angry when they were doing the deal. But um, I, I checked further and, well, it looked very bad and looked like there was lots of emotion. Uh, there was never any injuries. Nobody got cut. Nobody got wounded. Nobody stubbed a toe even. And this violence, apparent violence, was more for show and to keep the prices up. That was behind it more than anything. Interesting. Yeah, the, the name of the book is Athapaskan, Matriliney and Trade in Canada and Alaska, written by Wayne W. Allen. His website is www.allen.com. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, and link on directly to uh, Wayne's website and, and get information as well. I mentioned the art of the deal, and, and you've touched on some of the aspects of that. It's interesting because back so many years ago, they really had a handle on how they wanted to go about negotiating and pricing and pulling this off, didn't they? They were very sophisticated, it appears, in the way they went about that. Oh, yes. And if you accepted a deal right off the bat, you were considered a lousy uh, <laughs> trader, a lousy bargainer. If you couldn't bargain for hours and come up with every argument while about why his goods are no good and yours goods are great, then people would have no respect for you whatsoever. Your reputation depended on how hard a bargainer you were. And with that in mind, uh, there is a lot of uh, very vicious bargaining sessions as a result. It sounds like it, and you'll see those actually play out in the book. Uh, Wayne Allen, uh, Wayne W. Allen, our guest on the program. We're talking about the book, Athapaska, Matriliney, and Trade in Canada and Alaska. Um, it's interesting. We, I brought up the question a while ago, which was sort of a question, a foundation that a lot of people had in, in tracing your descendants through the mother's side of the family. What answers did you get on that? That's where, what, as I understand, that was one of the premises as you got started. Did you get an answer to that? And that answer has helped a lot of other people who had the same question. Uh, what was that question again? I didn't quite catch yeah, it. Yeah, in, in, in trying to train, uh, trying to track the uh, uh, genealogy from the uh, descendants from your mother's side of the family, the, uh, uh, how did that happen? Trace their ancestry through the, the, the mother's side of the family. Well, uh, the matrilineal descent groups uh, started with uh, coast, uh, people on the coast who were not Athapaskan. Uh, they were the Clinket, uh, and uh, they were very uh, relatively sedentary. They uh, did a lot of shellfish. They did a lot of net fishing. They went out along the coast for sea mammals, but. Uh, they weren't great travelers. Now, it, it's rather normal for that type of a people to have a matrilineal descent group. But what happened, uh, the Hudson Bay Company pulled up with big shiploads of goods off the coast, and they had to trade these to the people in the interior. N now, how the descent groups started is was very well recorded. 
the Tlingit, when they met the people from the interior, the Athapascans, they'd say, you're a wolf, you're a crow, you're a wolf, you're a crow. And at first the Athapascans didn't understand this, but then, oh yeah, they continue, oh yeah, it goes like that through the mother's side. So that's how it actually spread from one group to another. Uh, when the trading started, you'd say to your trading partner, you're a crow. You'd say to um, his wife, uh, you're, a, uh, you're a wolf. Yes. And they'd go through the whole families like that and point out who was who. And that's actually how it spread. Somebody recorded that, but... Uh, they didn't know the significance of that. Well, it's interesting, and, and you point all of this out in the book. What kind of reaction are have you gotten to the uh, to the book? And that question that people have been asking for a number of years that, that you were able to answer. And the great story of how, the, like I keep saying, because I'm, I'm impressed so many years ago, the structure of, of the way they went about conducting uh, conducting business. What kind of response are you getting to the book? Uh, pardon, I didn't catch that. Yeah, what kind of response are you getting to the book from uh, from others who have read this and are fascinated as well by the story? Oh, I, I'm uh, expecting to hear from some shortly. Haven't got a lot of feedback from on my book yet. Well, we'll get the book out there and get them in the right hands, and it's really fascinating information. From an anthropo anthropological, uh, anthrop as an anthropologist, let me try it that way, as an anthropologist, what has this meant for you in going back and, and putting these structures together? And can we learn something from these? Well, a lot of people just thought uh, when the natives referred to themselves as wolves and crows, that it was just, uh, well, they were insane or they were foolish or they were illogical. No, by doing this, they were not illogical. These wolf and crow groups uh, fitted right in with their society, helped their trading a lot, helped organize their, their society for ceremonies, and, uh, and it helped uh, decide who you were going to marry because you had to marry somebody in the other group. So, yes, it made a lot of sense. It just didn't make sense to the Europeans who were ignorant of the rest of the uh, Athapascan society. No, it's interesting, and you point out as well that uh, we may look at that and go crows and Indians and wolves and, and all of this, and then you point out we all belong to organizations that, that have similar names. So in a way, it's not all that different, is it? Uh, no, it's not all that different. I mean... Uh, when the natives traded, it was a big show. But when you're dealing with a, a, for a car at a dealership and you're trying to get down the price, the salesman will say, okay, I don't think I can go any lower. I'll have to check with the manager. <laughs> and he walks over into the manager's office, which is uh, conveniently has a full-length window in his office so you could see him. And the salesman gestures and bangs the desk and waves his arms and the <laughs> manager does the same thing. And finally he comes out and says, yeah, it was tough, but I got him to agree to the price. <laughs> uh, and that is just their way of uh, tricking you into not going any lower. Yes, and it's like it's a it's a trick that's been around for a long time. One of the the excerpts that you have on the website, and I think it sort of sums up what we've been talking about. They will have recourse to every subterfuge, even intimidation, to have the best of a bargain, and will do all in their power to fleece their opponent and boast of it afterwards. Does that pretty well sum up what we've talked about here? Oh yeah, that very much sums up uh, what we're talking about. Only I think the uh, Europeans were taken in quite a bit because these trading partners were in the same kin group. They were they had been uh, socializing all night the night before. They were daughter-in-law and son or father-in-law and son-in-law related. So yes, uh, they o overestimated the actual viciousness they were seeing. 
they're taken in by the uh, by the uh, play. That yes, yes, the show that was going on, the theater was rather than the deal was 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 getting their attention. A couple minutes left in the program. From your standpoint, someone who has has studied this, as you were doing the research, what were your thoughts? Were there surprises as you were going along this process? Did you learn something from this? Uh, there were not too many surprises, but one of the most remarkable things that I, I uh, discovered was something I couldn't put in my uh, book because it was off topic. And that was the story of a group of natives going in the middle of winter across the mountains to a, a new campsite that they had prepared and they were bringing the last of their people over the mountains to the new campsite. There was a storm brewing and an old lady had trouble walking and she was slowing them down and so one of them said, uh, look grandmother, we're very sorry but we're going to have to uh, leave you behind and you know what that means, but we'll come back in the spring and uh, give you a real nice uh, funeral feast. <laughs> It'll be great. And she said, okay, that's fine. Uh, go ahead. And she stayed there, and they left her there, and they continued on to the new campsite. The spring uh, uh, came, the snow, snow melted, and they thought of the old woman, and they gathered up all their food and all their regalia for their for her funeral potluck, and they trudged back up the mountain trail to where they had left her, and uh, they found her body. The only thing uh, wrong was uh, she was still walking around in it and talking. <laughs> uh, she had survived the whole winter alone up in the mountain with what she had just had on her and in her pockets, and they were stunned. They, would ne they had written her off completely. A and so after a celebration and some good food, I'm sure, they took her back to the new camp, and uh, she lived for several more years. That's she wasn't done yet. That's an amazing story that, that she got through that, and I'm sure was a source of inspiration to the people who went back expecting a, uh, a funeral, and suddenly they see her walking around. I can only imagine the, the shock as, as they went through that. With us on the program is uh, Wayne W. Allen. He's the author of the book, Athapaskan Matrilineal and Trade in Canada and Alaska. You'll find information on the book, a lot of great information as well, at his website, www.allen.com. And you can link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, living now in, uh, in Ottawa, retired and enjoying life in, uh, in Ottawa. Wayne, a pleasure having you on the program. A lot of great information today, including the final story, which is an inspiration to, to all of us to, uh, to, to try to keep going, no matter what the circumstances are. Thank you for being with us on the program today. Uh, you're welcome. It's been great to be here. A lot of fun, and Wayne Allen, our guest on the program, Athapaskan, Matrilineal, and Trade in Canada and Alaska, W.W. Allen, the website. Link on directly by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We're back on today's program right after these messages. Do stay tuned. <laughs> 